What's up, family? Thank you for tuning in to the Dream Nation podcast. My name is Casanova. I'll be your host, and I'm excited to be bringing to you entrepreneurs, thought leaders, and trailblazers from around the world. Stay locked in with us because we're about to go on a journey that will change your life. What's up, Dream Nation? It's Casanova again, and I'm excited today because we have somebody on the line that I've been a big fan of for the last couple months just because of how you know, consistent that she's been with not only her real estate business, but also her social media and just showing up for her audience. And so without further ado, I want to make sure that we can go ahead and give the proper introduction. But first off, you want to go ahead and say what's up to Dream Nation for me, Gogo. Hey, how are you? Thank you so much for having me. Yeah, it's, a, it's an honor to have you on here. I'm sure there's going to be so many nuggets that are dropped. But like I said, I always love to give the proper introduction. And so I like to say before, you know, because I like to think of entrepreneurs and you being a realtor as well. We are the um, the rawest form of an entrepreneur. We wear a lot of different hats. So I always like to think of us as superheroes. We're putting on capes, different capes every single day, and we're flying around. We're trying to solve a lot of different problems. So before you became this mega realtor, before you became, you know, 3% in the nation and now being able to teach other people social media, before all of that, if you can just go back to when you were just a young girl, tell me who is GoGo? Oh, wow. Um... Well, I was born in Romania, in Transylvania, part of Romania that's um, uh, mostly Hungarian. So I speak Hungarian by nationality. Uh, my family is still back there. I have a sister, mom and dad, grandpa, grandmas, cousins, all that. I decided to leave Romania. I borrowed $200 and I, <laughs> you, you like this story. Okay. So until 1989 in Romania, it was communism. So we didn't get to see any, imagine like living in a shoebox with a lid on is usually how I explain it. You don't see anything outside of the shoebox. Like that's your world, that's all you know. So when communism ended and they shot Ceausescu, they opened up the news and the television to the Western world. So the first time I saw a black person, my dad went and bought a color TV. He came home with two uh, VCRs, those tapes, you remember? Yeah, yeah. And, uh, and it was Eddie Murphy's two 48 hours, like the first 48 hours and the second 48 hours. And I remember standing in front of the television and just being glued to it. And I'm like, what is that? Like, I thought he was the funniest thing I have ever seen. That is my very first recollection of as me at eight years old going where that ever that man is at. Because I just thought he was so happy and I wanted to be that happy. Yeah. Um, so I, I, you know, as an eight year old, I just put the two together. I thought if I'm there where he's at, then I would be just as happy. Got it. Makes and sense. So that's my first, like, under unconscious, I guess, collection, recollection of mm -hmm. I'm going to America. And most people thinking then when I talk about Eddie Murphy's movie, Coming to America, is the movie that, that made me come to America, but it's not. Got <laughs> it's, it. It's 48 hours. And I always put it out there. If you know somebody who knows somebody who knows somebody who knows Eddie Murphy, please hook me up because I need to give that man a hug. Mm -hmm. um, he's, the, he's the reason that I am in this country. So that's how it started originally. That's my first recollection. And then through the years, um, I was always a little bit weird. I should say, like I had friends, not like I didn't have friends, but I always felt like an outsider. I always had like crazy big dreams and when I always wanted and I knew that I can achieve anything. And, and even when, you know, people or my parents or whatever would tell me, like even my parents told me, hey, if you want to go to college, it's on you. We can't afford to pay for you. So if you want to go to college, figure it out. So I did. I, I was always with scholarship everywhere I went. I, I, I left home when I was 14. I went to um, a, a board. I think it's called a, a boarding school. Yeah. You know what like I lived there. Um, it was a religious high school. We were allowed to go home one week in a month. And I was just always a very independent person. I, I don't like rules. <laughs> and my dad had a lot of them. And he always said, as long as you're under my roof, these are the rules. And if you don't like it, there's a door. Right. I was, okay. I don't like the rules. So peace out. <laughs> so I left at 14, um, went to boarding school um, in a different county. And so then, it was your choice to go to boarding school or were you just kind I of defined? Where am I going to go at 14? Like I was like, I know I need to go because it was one too many rules and I didn't like uh, living at home. Um, and I figured that's pretty much the only way to live away from home if I go somewhere where I can actually live there and not pay for it. So I got in with scholarship. Um, so my boarding and schooling and everything was free. I even got like, you know, food and stuff like that to send home. But and in boarding school, didn't you have a lot of rules as well? 
Yeah, but I think it was different. You know how kids are with their parents? Yeah. This is when a stranger tells you a rule that's different than when your mom and dad are trying to tell you now. Got it. Okay. You know, like, do you have kids? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I got an eight-year-old boy and two-year-old daughter. Okay, so do you ever hear how other people tell you how they are just amazing? <laughs> oh, yeah. So Teachers, sweet, everything, so right. Polite, so polite, and you're like, are you talking about my kid? <laughs> because right. they don't act that with you. You know, your, your mom and dad is different. This whole thing with the whole homeschooling thing right now with this COVID thing. I'm like, oh my gosh, those teachers, I miss them. Oh yeah, it's, it's great. It was funny, uh, you know, it's a little bit of a side note, but one of the first memes I seen before that everything started to be shut down, it was like some of your parents are getting a rude awakening that your kids are really like that now that you got them at home. Because some of it, you know, my kid's an angel on the other side of it. Teacher's like, oh, I need you to come up to the school. So it's funny that you say that. But yeah, I definitely understand what you mean because my son is always on 10 when he's around us. But at school, he's, he's, he's an angel is what they say. And I also probably needed that, you know, like uh, as much as I thought my parents had a lot of rules, when I moved into the dormitory, I realized, oh, hold on a minute. Like we are up at eight and then we have a religious hour and then we have to sing and then we have to do this and then we go to school and then we have homework and then you do this and then you have dinner and then you sing again and then you pray for an hour, then you go to bed. Like it was very structured, structured. Uh, I guess I didn't necessarily know. And in, in my 14 year old mind, I just wanted away from home. Mm hmm. You know, and then and, and I got another rude awakening, but I think it helped me. Uh, it helped me to, I guess, learn of kind of helped me realize who I am and how I fit in or do I fit in, um, you know, kind of just figure out the different type of people and, and my personality when I'm in a crowd and things like that. So um, I learned a lot about myself and then I went to college in a different country. And uh, I did two and a half years of that. In third year, we had to uh, pass a high level of English test and I didn't speak English at all. So I figured, well, the best way to learn it is if I go and live between the ones who speak it and then I pick it up and then I'll go back and pass the exam. So my goal was to come to the U.S. for a year. So I came as an au pair, a living nanny. Um, and um, my goal was to go back and, you know, pass the exam in English and continue college and finish it and yada, yada. Well, that didn't happen. So... Um, met my husband two months after I moved here. So I moved here January 20th of 2003 is when my little feet touched you as ground. <laughs> um, and, and how old were you at this time? Not yeah. trying to age you, just to, just to yeah. try to see where you were on your... I was 48. I'm, I own my age. Yep. I was 21. Got it. Okay. Got and, it. Um, so you probably felt years. like you were grown already. I mean, leaving home at 14, seven years and, and just <laughs> making your own decisions for the most part and having that structure, you probably felt like, no, there's nothing that could really stop me. No, no. I mean, just my personality, nothing that can really stop me. And my parents knew that early on. Um, I always was going to that next thing, next thing, next thing. I'm always constantly chasing something, some next level of life. Um, and I think eventually they just caught on. There's nothing they can do to stop me. They have to, you know, let me live my life. And 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 thankfully, they are the parents who they are because I wouldn't be who I am today if it wasn't for their um, ability to allow me to be me. You know, where some, I mean, I'm a mom now. So I see how what I think it's happiness is how we are uncondition, un unconsciously kind of forcing it onto our children. Uh, wanting them to be happy and since this is how I know happy I think this is how everybody's happy and realizing hold on a minute my son is totally different than right and I think that's so powerful that you say that because for so many people um, myself included we think that we already know and we try to protect our children and we try to force on just like you said the happiness and so for you being able to grow up that way I think that it probably helps you in so many ways and so for another parent that's listening right now you know that could be some really really valuable advice of even at the age of 14 where your kid's like you know what I'm, I'm leaving I'm going away and and most parents I would say 90, 95% of parents would probably say, no, absolutely not. Not unless you were a really bad kid. They would be like, please go. <laughs> right, right. Like we don't have a choice anymore. It's either that or, or in jail. But you know, especially me having a two-year-old daughter, I couldn't imagine letting, um, were you the only girl or the youngest no, girl? I have a sister. I have a sister. Got it. Is she older or younger than you? Younger. Younger. Okay. So, I mean, obviously it's, there's never a right time to let either of your daughters or any of your daughters go, but I couldn't imagine at 14, letting my daughter go be raised by someone else. I feel like that, you know, what are your thoughts on people feeling like that then they failed 
at 14, if my daughter's ready to leave, you know, and I'm like, no, no, no. You know, if I let her go in my subconscious, it's like, I couldn't do the job. Yeah. Well, I, are we going to go deep here? It is gonna yeah. Be- yeah. Let's, let's do it. I, I love it. My thank God my parents don't speak English. Um, <laughs> they're going to hear this one day. I grew up, my dad is an angel now, but back at the time when I was a child, he was an alcoholic. And I think it was because um, he has that entrepreneur mentality, but when you're living a life in communism, you're not allowed to do anything. You do everything for the commune. So you can do whatever you do. You can pull your weight a hundred times over somebody else. Everybody gets paid the same amount. Mm -hmm. So there was no way for him to express his entrepreneurial skills. And because of that, I think he had really not, there was no concerts, there was no movies, there was no nothing. Like there was nothing else to do but go to work and go home and drink your pain away. And I think that's where it came from for him is not being able to express himself the way he likes to live life. So he was an alcoholic. And my dad, when he's sober, he's the biggest sweetheart. But when he's drunk, lights are out. Like the biggest asshole, excuse my French, you'll ever made, um, unreasonable. He would beat us. He would break things. He would throw things out on the window. He would kick in the door instead of using the keys, um, that kind of stuff. And, and my mom and my sister are more quiet and they can take that kind of behavior. I would be right there in front of him and just, you know, hitting back when he hits me. And, and I knew that is not, it would have not ended well if, um, if I stayed there longer, especially as I was growing and I was, you know, getting some power over him. Uh, I remember one time being in a big fight and like literally fist fight and I was on top of him and I remember looking over, we fell down and next to a table and I remember looking over the top of the table to see if I could grab something. And, wow. and that is my recollection and I need to get out of here because it, his behavior will never be okay with me. And I also had so much anger towards it that I didn't know if I could stop myself in a situation like that. So that that's one of the reasons why I was out of there at, at 14 because I couldn't, I couldn't take it. My dad now is an angel. He hasn't drank in years. Uh, he turns his life around. He's an entrepreneur now, owns multiple businesses, multiple homes. He does really well now, but that, that wasn't my childhood. I think it's an Eastern European thing. My parents never told me they love me or they're proud of me. There's no like words of affirmation. There's no hugs. There's no touch. There's no nothing. Like, there's nothing. It's, it's a very cold um, kind of way of, of raising children. And I guess that's why I say that I never belonged there because my sister and I, we have the same set of parents, we ate the same food, we were raised the same way, and she was perfectly fine with that, where it's always bothered me. Growing up, and I, and, I, and this is where I say, it, Tony Robbins is where I, and I came to this conclusion at UPW, um, I held it against my parents my whole life of how they didn't love me. I thought I was adopted. I thought something's wrong with me. Maybe I'm not lovable, blah, blah, blah. And at Tony Robbins at UPW, I figured out, he says, and if you're holding something against someone, they did or they didn't do to you. In my case, they didn't. They didn't love me. Then you, ask, then you also have to give them credit for what you became of it. Hmm. That's and wow. It, That's very, very powerful. Right. And I've never heard that. You have to give them credit for what you became of it. Wow. Because if it wasn't for that, if it wasn't for them bringing me up like that. So Going back again, I remember one time standing on stage, um, I won a, recit- a recital, I think it's called a recital, when you're reciting a poem. Yeah, recital. Yeah. Recital, yeah. So I won a recital competition in my county. I was first in my county in that age. And the theater was full with people and nobody from my, for me. Like, mm. nobody came. Like, my parents really, I don't know if they didn't care or they were just so busy trying to, to um, provide um, alive for us that they really miss the small stuff, you know, but those small stuff were big things for me. Right. Um, and I just realized I constantly was achieving because I thought maybe if I achieve that, then they're going to tell me they're proud of me. Ooh, maybe that, maybe that, maybe if I achieve that now, then they're going to tell me they love me. So Did I you ever voice it. that to them? No, like was it not growing so up. you kind of just held it so by the time that you became really in your mind a grown woman it was kind of almost that you had a lot of resentment towards them and you were like I'm gonna show you yeah and it's also I mean it became a habit you know growing up doing things over and over again constantly and that's what Tony says you have to give them credit because if it was if they brought me up the way I needed to be loved and and, and supported then I wouldn't be who I am today because right, I right. would have not started that fire in me of like, okay, the next thing, now the next thing, the next thing is going to, you know, make them really proud. 
and now it's a habit. Now I don't know how to live life um, besides just going for that next thing because now I know I can. Right. And you're not living with your emotions and your expectations on someone else giving you essentially approval to go out there and and be great. Not anymore. I I left that at UPW's floor in New Jersey in 2017. Got it. No, I I love it. I love it. So talk to me about, though, where did you get the business sense from? Because, you know, you said at the time your dad you know, drinking a lot, all these things. Did your mom, was anybody in your family and you left home at 14. So how do you now develop a business sense? Because going off and being a nanny when you first get to the US, now all of a sudden you're learning how to support other people rather than learning how to necessarily be a leader. You're just kind of doing what you're told to do. So where did that come in to where you were like, no, I'm going to go off and I'm going to really live out my dreams? Well, again, that, I think that, again, comes back with personality. Like, I remember the first time I was interviewed at NSF International. That's my real official, like, big corporate America job. And it was entry level. Like, it was level two, which is the basic level in the company. And I had to go to, like, freaking 11 interviews. And one of them, the head of the, um, the warehouse guy interviewed me and he said, okay, so this, this is a scenario. Let's say we are, and th- mind you, this is bottom position. Okay? Yeah. When I'm applying for, and he goes, okay, let's let's play this scenario. We are organizing the warehouse, and everybody's there. The question is, are you the one who's barking the orders, or are you the one that is like, you know, organizing the shelf really nicely? And I'm thinking, I know what you want me to say. You want me to say I'm organizing the shelf because that's the position that I'm applying right, right, right. <laughs> But I just told him, I said, I have to be honest with you, and I just have to say the truth, even if I don't get the job. I would be in the middle of the warehouse on the top of a box, barking the orders. <laughs> and he left. Of course, I got the job. Um, but that was the truth. Like, I can't lie. Like, that's my personality. Like, I don't do well with orders. And I think that's, um, especially if I have a better idea. Don't get me wrong. If somebody has an amazing idea and I think it's an amazing idea, I can follow them and I will go and do it. But if I have a different opinion on it, I'm going to do whatever I'm going to do. And, and, and that doesn't go very well in, in a regular job. Definitely um, not. And, and if you want to be happy, I mean, I've been very successful in corporate America job. I've worked sales in a jewelry store. I've been a nanny. I've, been, I've worked in a restaurant. I can do a job. If I have to make money for my family, I can take an order and do my job. But that wouldn't be the happiest way of living my life. Got it. So and, where, where do you transition from now? All of a sudden you go off because you started out corporate America. What makes you leave corporate America to say that this is not for me? So I, I'm a mom of two. When my second, when our second baby boy was born, uh, we almost lost him about nine weeks old. He got Giardia. Um, so, so he got um, Giardia freshwater parasite and we almost lost him because they couldn't figure out what was wrong with him. Um, so we got transferred from one hospital to another hospital. We ended up spending Christmas in the hospital. It was right around that um, uh, swine flu season. So I couldn't see my other baby. If I left the hospital, they would have not let me back in. Um, so we literally never left his side for over 30 days. Um, I don't think I showered maybe twice in 30 days. Like it was, it was that bad. Like we would not leave his side. We almost lost him. Um, right around that time I got, I lost my job because uh, I just went back from maternity leave. Like this was literally, I got nine weeks off and this was nine weeks and three days when he got sick. Um, so they called me and they said, sorry, you don't have any more sick time. You don't have any more vacation days. You have to let you go because if you don't, then everybody they would have to honor that to everybody else in the company. So on top of my child being sick, I also lost my job. And it, it was a blessing, um, to be honest with you, because it allowed me to uh, stay home with him. Yeah. And to, I, I could have not imagined handing my 10-week-old or 12-week-old baby at the time, by the time he got out of the hospital, uh, over to somebody that, a stranger, to raise him so I can go to work. So I stayed home uh, for about a year and a half. And at that time, I realized that I'm not a stay-at-home mom material. I need to go and provide and put makeup on and, you know, talk to adults and contribute to society and, and, and feel like I'm worth something or I'm bringing something to this world. Um, so right around that time, I, there was a restaurant that opened here near to us. I went to waitress. I'd never waitress before. Um, realized that's not for me. I figured that would be fun because it's just a couple hours, you know, a couple of days a week. In the afternoon, I go mix cash. I come home. It get, kind of gets me out of the house. Right around that same time, my neighbor who's the capital, uh, who's the marketing director for Capital Title, 
she asked me if I, um, or she told me really pretty much that I'm so social. She goes, I would make a great realtor. She's like, I already talked to this broker. You should go talk to them. I was like, oh, I watch HGTV. I can, I can do this. <laughs> thinking, thinking that's what all it takes is what you see on HGTV. So I went and talked to that broker. That's the only broker I talked to. It was real estate one. Um, they said that if I pass my license, they would pay for it. They would reimburse me my first transaction. I was like, okay. I went through school. I passed the first round. I went and started with them. I was with them for six and a half years. And that's pretty much how my whole real estate career started. Now, granted, I don't have necessarily a business education. I mean, I have two years of college. Um, I have basics of business. I um, never really learned marketing. I never really learned what to do with money, how to make money, what to do after you make it, uh, how to invest it, how to grow it, how to, you know, none of that. Right. Uh, I've made plenty of mistakes uh, along the way, but I guess I am willing to make those mistakes and learn. Um, and I think that's the success, I guess. The reason to my success is that I have zero problem grabbing life by the balls and going for what I want from this life and asking people for I'm like, hey, I want an interview with you. Can I pick your brain? I want to know what you know. I'm a sucker for information. I am in the sponge mm -hmm. phase of life of like, I want to know everything. And um, right now I'm learning how to <laughs> how to trade stocks. I don't know if you saw that. I figured I'm no, like, I, I didn't see that, but that's definitely a good, I mean, obviously where the stock market is. And I've been telling people about even just learning the game of real estate right now, because mm -hmm. obviously we don't really know where the industry is about to go on the mortgage side of things over the next six months. And so for a lot of people that might not be able to recover from this, obviously there's going to be a lot of investors that are born in this time. Mm -hmm. So I think that is definitely good to be learning stocks. And to be honest with you, I've been learning a little bit about stocks as well. Mm -hmm. uh, but it, it's it's so, it's so funny because it's a... Uh, you have it's to a, download the app Robinhood. It's so fun. I'll send you my link if you don't have it yet. <laughs> get, a, got it. get a free stock and uh, just kind of start trading. I invested $200. I said, you know, I'm not going to break our bank on it, you know, but yeah. I will set this on $200 and see what I can turn it into. So I started this on Saturday. Let me show you what my two hundred dollars is worth right now. Three, okay, all right. What it, if you don't mind me asking? There's somebody listening right now, and they're thinking, "Okay, I got two hundred dollars. What did you What did you go after? What What was your decision making on that first stock that you chose?" Brand well, I just new when I got into real estate, I got into real estate at the tail end of of the 2008 crash. So I got in in 2011, all we did was short sales and foreclosures. Mm -hmm. So all of the people that knew me, they were like, you're, you're crazy. Like you're out of your mind. If you think you're going to make money in real estate right now, you're, you're insane. Right. And I was, <laughs> I am a little bit, I guess, crazy when I, when I put things in my mind and I figured at that time, I'm like, okay, if I can figure out real estate at the bottom, at the shittiest time, when all we do is short season foreclosures, when the good times come around, I'll be living like fish in water because by that time, I'm an expert. Right. And that is exactly what happened. I, you know, I hustled in my very first year. I made $16,000 in commission all year. Granted, I didn't work full time. I worked, you know, when in the evenings when my husband was home with the children and on weekends. But that's not some, that's not money you can live off of. You know, I'm working for a full year. I probably would have made more money at, Marshalls working seven bucks an hour. Right. So, you know, that's my first year, but I figured if I can figure it out at the bottom, then I live like fishing water when good times come around and seeing these stocks, like everything just plummeted a couple of days ago. So let me buy, you know, $3, $4, $7 stocks and hopefully so what was, I need them. So you what's the stock? Um, so I have stocks and do you want to see, you want to know my stocks? Okay. Yeah. I mean, I, I think there's some people on here on Instagram. There's some people listening as well. And uh, <laughs> they want to know like, what's that tip? If they can make over the course of four days, if they can make $150 by doing absolutely nothing but. Yeah, I mean, I signed up Saturday um, during the day now granted with this app and I don't know, this is how much I don't know about stocks. I don't know if you can trade all the time. Uh, but with this app, you can only trade during business hours, Monday to Friday, 8 to 5. Okay. So I, when I got the app on Saturday, I figured, well, I get it Saturday. It gives me all the all weekend to kind of figure it out and, you know, upload my money. And then when Monday morning comes around and I can start buying some stocks, then by that time, I kind of know what I want to buy. So that's exactly how it started. Now, when you sign up, if you use somebody's link, like I use my friend's link, he recommended me, we each get a free stock. So my very first stack I got through just signing up and scratching, it, it gives like a scratch off. So it's kind of fun. So I scratched it off and I got a fourth stack. 
Ford stock. Oh, okay, yeah. so the first one was the Ford stock. My husband has a Ford F one fifty, so I was like, oh, look at look at right. it's what you I'm know. I'm part owner of Ford. <laughs> gotcha. <laughs> Ford one stock and it's four dollars, but I own one stock. Yeah. So that's how I looked at it. Then I got um, when you refer a lot of people, and I, you know, I, I use Instagram for pretty much everything, good, bad, and the ugly. I share everything that I do. So I shared this idea. I did a swipe up. I shared my link with everybody. So then everybody who downloaded it for each of those, I got a free stock. Everything. How many, right. how, so you wound up getting what, like seven, eight free stocks as well? Oh no, I ended up getting like thirty-eight of them. Got it. Okay. So sharing, <laughs> so sharing that referral link through Robinhood after you sign up and you get your free stock, that can yeah. also help you to be able to generate some more free income. Yes, absolutely. These are free stocks and now it's the bottom, which means and it can only go up from here. Got it. So I love it. Stock, like for example, let's look at Ford for example. It's four dollars and eighty-seven cents is when I got it. So even though I paid zero for it, when I received that free stock, it was worth four dollars and eighty nine cents or eighty seven cents. Fifty two weeks high is ten dollars and fifty six cents. So if it goes back to the regular height of the market, it's more than going to double. It's time and a half. It, it, it's what I got it for. Yeah. Well, no, I, I love that. I, I absolutely love it. So this is why it's so important to learn a new skill because in this downtime, you never know the types of uh, profits that you can make even when the markets close and when you're just buying things that you already know. So I, I, I love I got, that. Love it. So I got four stocks in Sirius radio station. Okay. I got three, sta- three stocks in Vray, which is an MRI company. They build like MRIs and x-rays and stuff. I got three stocks in Cody, which is, I don't know what Cody does. It's a major, major player in fast growing beauty industry. So I got three stocks in that. I got one stock in Macy's, two stocks in Cleveland Cliffs, which is, I think it's a mining company, like oil and iron and mining company. And then I got one share in Limelight Networks, which is, I think it's like- a- So let me ask, did you do any research on these companies prior or you just looked yeah, at what they're, they're so 50 too high? Has- no, so these are free. So got when it. somebody signs up, they give you three options, like a scratch up. You have to, uh, they give three images on the screen and you uh, have to choose and then you scratch it off and you get a free stock of whatever. Now you can get an Apple stock, you could get you know very expensive stocks as well, but that is- <clears throat> You gotta get lucky. Better. Exactly. You're very lucky. Ninety percent of the time, you're going to get stocks under ten dollars, so somewhere gotcha. between four to ten dollars. But the way I look at it is free money. Yeah, I love you it. Know, free money. Starbucks, that that five dollars and I got now could be worth twenty five a month from now, and no, then I, I sell that, and then I'll buy something that it's much more expensive. Cool. I I love it. Now let's, I'm glad that you brought up that point of free money because for a lot of people right now that's going through this pandemic and they're trying to figure out how they can grow not only their brand or maybe their business that they're going to get off the ground, but at the same time, how they can grow their income and how they can use their brand to build income. And I think that you've done a very good job of this, of growing your social media audience and now teaching other people as well. So that's kind of what I wanted to ask you is like, for a lot of people that's sitting at home right now, and they're scrolling through Instagram and maybe they're just consuming a lot of information, but they're not the ones that are out there putting it into action on how they can build their own business using it. What are some tips that you give any of your clients that are looking to get real estate off the ground for them? Like, is there a certain platform that everybody should be looking at? Um, Is there a certain, you know, tactic that people should be doing off the start of how do they start to learn the value of social media and building a business from it? Yeah. So I don't know if you realize, but more and more companies are not necessarily advertising on television yet uh, or anymore. They will give money to influencers to advertise. Mm -hmm. It's because if you think about it, and influencers are people that are made made a name for themselves. They have a large amount of followers on different social media platforms um, because those people choose to follow them and they'll give them the time of the day. So when a company reaches out to them, their followers are going to actually see that post. They're going to act on it because they trust the person that the information is coming from. Um, so it's way, way higher return on the investment for the companies versus just putting it out there on national television where people are just so used to muting TV while the, while the ads come on that they don't pay attention. Um, so I think the faster you realize that you are your brand hmm. and you're not selling real estate, you're selling yourself and you're selling your services. 
So the faster you can implement those changes to your account, the more followers you're going to have. If you are posting the last open house and the newest listing and the last closing you had, people in average are on the market every seven to 10 years for about six months. And then they have zero interest in real estate. They could care less unless the market tanks and they want to know how much my house is worth. But other than that, everybody's just kind of going on with their lives. So if that's all you're doing on social media, it's not going to work. Your account is not going to grow. You're not really going to get the leads. I mean, yeah, maybe somebody that's your cousin knows anyway that you're a realtor, but you're not going to get those people that you don't personally know to follow you. And that's the whole goal. You want eyeballs on your account. You want to be an option. Because with millennials, they don't want a cold call. They're not going to talk to you on the phone. They're not going to make eye contact. They're not used to that. You know, I mean, they're not going to meet with you in person. Like those old techniques are not going to work with the millennials. So with the millennials, you need to exist. While they are doing this, you need to pop up. If you mm. don't pop up, you don't exist to them. And that's the, that's the whole goal. It's not every post you're going to make is going to give you um, a lead. So don't look at it that way. The way I look at it is through my career, um, I have sold over probably 60 some million in real estate transactions personally. And for that, how much money did I make? Because everything I do comes from social media. Now, I also have about 11 different sources of income, most of them, most of which are passive. Um, Warren Buffett and, you know, Tony Robbins also say that the average multimillionaire or billionaire has seven different ways of income, six of which are passive. They only trade their own time for one. And if you are trading your time, or something, eventually you're going to run out of time. So in order to make money, you have to charge more, you'll have to sell a higher ticket item, or you have to make more time and you can't make more time unless you work yourself to death. We all only have 24 hours a day. Um, so I figured out I have to be able to make money while I'm sleeping. If you Got think of it, right. make a social media post, let's say I make it at 10 o'clock this morning, it's that still going now, right now. It's going to work two years from now when you see it. It's going to work two weeks now when you see it. It's going to work whenever the other person sees it. That social media post always working for me. I only work for that five minutes when I put it up there, but that post will always work for me. I got it. I love it. Now, let me ask, is there one platform that you think right now is either undervalued or underserved? Like, where should people be looking? I mean, even though I use Instagram, I think many agents don't. And the biggest, I mean, TikTok, yes, TikTok has a large platform. It's probably larger now on the world than any other platform, but they're all teenagers. They're not going to be buying houses anytime soon. So that's not where I would want to market. It's fun to spend some time on it, even though I removed it from my phone because I saw an article yesterday how they are downloading all of your data, everything from your keystrokes to your location, to what you search on Google, to everything, and they ship it to China. So I was like, mm, yeah, no, I don't like that. Yeah. So if, you on, if you go to my Instagram, Google's Real Estate, you can see my last two posts about that. So I ended up taking TikTok off my phone, just so I don't use it anyway. You have to have it on there, but I don't like my information being sent to other countries. Um, anyway, so I think Instagram is way underused for what the potential is. Um, I don't think most agents just do it at all. Hmm. Got it. No, I, I love that. And for me, I've been using Instagram, I would say for a couple of years now, but I think that still there's a lot of people that don't understand monetization from it. They understand how to scroll. They understand how to put up pictures and maybe how to put hashtags. But can you talk about like, cause you said, Hey, you have been monetizing Instagram and I know you sell your courses and things like that. How can someone figure out how they can even get their first win with monetizing Instagram? Is there an easy system that you always recommend? Recommend? Oh, absolutely. So Instagram only allows you to put it up one link. So that's your link in your bio. Instagram doesn't like you to take traffic away. So what, well, on Facebook, you can post a www.blahblahblah.com. On Instagram, you can't do that. They don't want you to take the traffic away from Instagram. So to go around it, they allow you to put one link into your bio. Now, again, as you said, us realtors, we wear a lot of freaking hats. So wh which link would I put up there? Like it would have to be the one that makes me the most amount of money. Right. So, but that's not enough because I don't want to have all my eggs in one basket. So I want to have multiple eggs on there. So if you, again, go to my googlesrealestate.com, go to my link, you click that. That's a link tree link. It's L-I-N-K-T-R-E-E. -E. So put it in Google and create yourself a link tree account and that what happens is Linktree will give you one link 
under which you can have multiple different links. So when somebody clicks that one link, it's going to take them to a list of links and then they can choose. So for example, when I was talking to, uh, I posted yesterday about the, the stocks and everything that I've decided to do, like do facials while I'm home and, and work out and get a banging body and then figure out stock market. So that's my downtime activities while I'm home. And so I posted about that. And then I told everyone to go over to my bio if they want to download the Robinhood app. If they also want to start figuring out stocks, it's a free app. You know, I mean, it's not going to cost you anything. You don't have to upload the $200 and I did. Some people, all they need to do is just share with your contacts in your phone. Right. So every person that ends up downloading the app, you got a free stock. Even if the stock is four bucks, it's four bucks you didn't have before. Four bucks right. you didn't have to work for. And that four bucks could be worth 400 when you retire 30 years from now. I can definitely I mean, dig not, it. Yeah. So I'm not doing it because I want to necessarily like trade it and all that. I have a day job. Like I'm not going to have time for that, but I want to have an idea, an understanding of how it works. I want to like be able just to with my morning coffees, coffee, scroll up, look at the stock market and see how my stocks are doing. So that's pretty much, I want to have, I don't like not understanding something. And even though we have our retirement account with our financial advisor and he does his whatever he does. I don't like not understanding what he does. Yeah. No, you know I, mean? I hear you there. I definitely hear you there. And I think that's very powerful to know, right? Is, is those ways that you have multiple products still using Instagram because it's that mix, it's that hybrid, you know, Facebook, you also have the TikToks, the um, Snapchat, you have a lot of different things, but Instagram, I think is still underserved. So I'm glad that you brought that up. Um, for anybody that right now is wondering where can they get their start in learning business? Have you ever had, you talked about Tony Robbins, uh, UPW, but is there anybody that you would consider besides Tony Robbins that's been a big mentor for you that has like maybe a book that's out that you would recommend reading or a podcast that you would recommend listening to? Oh gosh, that's a loaded question because I have so many. I feel well, like- We I only want have- one. We only want one. You can give one. Oh my gosh. Uh, okay. Well, book, um, as much as it, okay. I believe that a business sense, it, it truly comes from believing in yourself, you know, and for that, you have to go through a lot of soul searching to figure out who you are. Um, one of my favorite books that it is a business book, um, but it is also a motivational kind of self searching book it's called um uh the hold on the greatest salesman in the world okay it's a small little pocket book it's about you know yay big literally fits into your pocket um it starts out slow it starts out in jesus's era and um, my mentor at the time recommended it to me this was probably 2015 or so and I was like, seriously, like, this is the slowest book. And it's about Jesus's age and era. And how is this going to relate to business? Like, I don't get it. And then when you get to the scrolls, there's a bunch of scrolls in the book that you need to read. Now, then it gets really good. Got and it. My favorite book about it's a go to. I, I grab it all the time and just kind of open it. I believe that God will show you what you need to read. So I usually just close my eyes, open the book, whatever it needs to open. And I read that part. I read it over and over again. Um, So that's the greatest salesman in the world. Um, It's an amazing little soul food. Got it. All right. We'll we'll definitely drop the link in the show notes on that. And uh, do you know who it's by? Uh, No, but I can look. It's in my Amazon link. So if you go on my Instagram, in my links, go to Amazon, go to books, and it's on there. Okay, cool. Um, Um, Again, I don't waste time. So I listen to a ton of podcasts. I literally go to YouTube every single morning when I wake up and put my makeup on. While I'm getting ready, I'm usually listening to something on YouTube. So for me, inspirational videos or motivational videos are very important. And I leave it up to YouTube and God to kind of choose what I need to hear that day. But they already know uh, what I like. So when I open my YouTube, something motivational pops up because they know that's what I prefer. So then I just click on it and start listening. Um... I believe the universe talks to you. Um, it will show you what you need to hear. It will guide you where you need to go. It will show you how you're going to get there. I do believe that you need to know where you want to go. You need to know where you are and you need to know where you want to go and by when. Hmm. So if you can put an end date on it, if you can tell the universe of where, what you want from this life, what you want to accomplish this year, and you put an end date on it, the universe is your built-in GPS. We all have it. I love it. it. Take you from A to Z, but you need to know what A is 
where are you? And you need to know what Z is, where you want to be and by when. And it's going to guide you there. And these motivational videos and stuff are helping me grow to become the person I need to be to go to that next level. Because you can't stay who you are and expect a different level of life. I love it. I love it. Well, hey, this has been phenomenal. And uh, I'm sure it's, there's a lot of value. And I can't wait till we release the episode because I know we're going to get crazy feedback on it. But let me ask, for anybody that is inspired right now, they're ready to, to go take action, take life by the horns. They come from a situation that's similar to yours, but now they're really looking to make sure that, you know, within seven years, they can be out there and, and even shorter time than that, they can really be taking life by the horns. But they have that young, they have that little voice in their head, right? That says that they're not strong enough, maybe they're not smart enough, or they just don't have enough resources. What's the one thing that you say to that person to get them to just take action? That your own internal voice has to be louder than that little voice on your shoulder. You have to know who you are. As soon as you believe in yourself, there's nothing anybody can say that you can or cannot do. You're going to go and do it anyway. Like I joke around, I say, I'm going to go do it twice and take photos and post it on Instagram while I'm at it. Hmm. Because I believe whatever I set my mind to, if my internal God feeling, God feeling tells me I can do it also, I believe God wouldn't put an idea in your head if he doesn't believe that you already have the skills that it takes to get it done. Hmm. Wow. Otherwise, he would have given that idea to somebody else. So if that idea popped up in your head, it is the universe, it's God, it's the mother nature, it's the higher power, whatever you call it, it, it given it to you because you have the skills to make it happen. Now, do you have the guts? To make it happen and go for it, that I don't know. Some people will give up on themselves. Some people will grab life by the walls. I definitely grab life by the when, when I die, I don't want to look back and, and be like, I didn't do, I wish I did that. I'd rather fail at it 10 times and be like, I tried it. I gave it all I freaking got. But I want to be proud of myself at the pearly gates if I ever make it. And I want God to be proud of me. Then I put every skill that he provided me with to good use on this earth. I love it. Well, there you have it, people. Hopefully somebody's listening at this right now and this is all they need to hear to, as you say, take life by the horns or, or take the bull by, by, the, by the balls. Or- <laughs> <laughs> by the balls. Right? Yeah. No, this has been this has been amazing. Well, thank you. For anybody that wants to stay connected with you, where can they find you at? The quickest is Google's Real Estate on Instagram. Got it. There you have it. Google's Real Estate on Instagram. This has been a phenomenal episode. Until the next time, I want to say thank you for coming on and joining us. And remember, Dream Nation, in the dream we trust, but we must take action. Otherwise, it will only merely be a fantasy. That's the episode for today. Let me know if you got any value out of this. If you liked anything about it, reach out to me on Instagram or Twitter, any of the social media networks. And Of course, leave me a review, iTunes, Stitcher, SoundCloud, wherever you're hearing this at. I would love to have a review to show, you know, what you're getting out of this. Is there anything that I could do better? Is there any way that I can add more value to you? So hopefully you all take some action today. That's my show. I love you all. Be great. But remember, we must take action.